old Tain Castle Park. There's a wee fit for Tim that will lay me its mark. They've won all the honours for footballing arts, and there's nae other team they compare with a heart. Say cheers, hearty airs. If you can spell it, then here's what it says. Hearts, hearts, glorious hearts. Ladies and gentlemen, can I have your attention, please? Before we move on to the first speaker, just to like express some words of thanks, particularly to Hart Midlothian for allowing us to use their premises here. When we had some of our fruitful discussions with the board, and I know it's the chief executive sitting down there, uh, we were a bit concerned about the prices here, quite frankly. But the chairman very kindly said, Mr. Deans, that we would have family prices. Well, when we go visiting their family or they visit us, visit us, us, us we don't charge them anything. And kindly did he, we're not being charged. Anyway, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. As I said before, there's no need for a great introduction because he is the legendary John Robertson. Thank you. Is that one Thanks very much. It's great to be here, especially for such a good cause. Nice to see some of the boys, some well-kent faces. And um, there is a few apologies to make. Bill McMurdo, my agent, couldn't be here today. Agent Orange, as he's known, is in Brazil, talking to Ronnie Biggs. <laughs> I can assure you, ladies and gentlemen, it's the first time Bill will have a client who's a bigger crook than he is. <laughs> no, actually, it's, it's funny the things you find out, because I was talking to Robin about his football discussions with the Chief X, and he said, actually, Robo, he says, you know the difference between Chris Robinson and a Iraqi terrorist? I says, no, I don't. He says, at least you can negotiate with an Iraqi terrorist. <laughs> But anyway, it's, it's great to be here and uh, I said to Robin, what do you want me to talk about? He says, well, just talk about your career and your goals. I says, Robin, I've only got a day 20 minutes. <laughs> but it's been a long time, 18 years at heart, it's a long time. And uh, to go through some of the people obviously I've been working with and against is Alan McDonald was the first manager and he was the first one to really get a hold of me and, and teach me how to train properly, how to eat properly and how to shake hands properly and tell everybody how old your granny really is. <laughs> and it's the amazing thing, our, our sprint coach, or I think that's what you call it, isn't it? Fitness coach, hanging on. <laughs> Bert used to do all the training with George O'Neill and he used to start it on the 11th of July. And Bert was amazed because when he turned up the following day, there was only three people at Tyne Castle. <laughs> and he was explaining they were on a sponsored walk in Airdrie. The belt's tricky, so for future we started on the 13th of July. But, uh, no, I mean, you go down, there's, there's other managers, uh, there's Frank Connor, the great Frank Connor. The best story I know about Frank was, he was manager of the Eighth Rovers and was struggling, second division, and it was, the fog was rolling in at Kirkcaldy, and the referee was going to abandon the game. And he said to Frank Connor, look, I'm going to have to call it off, the Eighth Rovers were one now, and Frank was livid. He says, ref, you can't, just keep going, I have a couple of minutes, no longer to go. So the ref gave it a couple of minutes, come on, says, look, Frank, I'm really, really sorry, he says, but I'm going to have to abandon the game. She says, it's getting too, too foggy. Frank says, no, come on, it's clear as a bell. Keep going, keep going. She says, look, I'll give it another two minutes. So he gave it another two minutes. Comes rushing across, says, Frank, look, there's 15, 12 minutes to go, whatever. He says, I'm standing in the middle of the park. I can't see that goal. And I turn around and I can't see that goal. I'm calling the game off. And Frank Connor said to him, I've only got one question to ask you there. He said, what is it? He said, what's that up there? He said, Frank, that's the moon. He said, well, how far do you want to fucking see? <laughs> And Frank Connor left, and we got the gruesome twosome. Tom Forsyth and Tommy McLean. Oh. <laughs> Tommy McLean's nickname was Thrush, because he's an irritating little fanny gentleman. <laughs> Tom Forsyth, true story. Tom Forsyth, honestly, <laughs> one of them. Nice man, but a wee bit dense. <laughs> and we used to go training, and Tom used to get all the boys, and the ground staff boys would get all the footballs in, and they'd get all the cones picked up. And one day we were up at Redford Barracks, and Tom Forsyth was counting all the footballs, he's like, blah, 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 18, 19. And he called the young boys, I said, there should be 20 balls here, get in the bushes, get in the trees, find this last ball. And the, the young boys went for half an hour, they were in brambles, they were up trees, they were in bushes, and they couldn't find this ball. And they come back, and big Derek Holmes, who's at Ray Throne, turned around and said, he was quite a bright lad. 
<laughs> well, he could count to 20, let's put it that way. And he came by and says, Tom, there's 20 footballs here. He says, there's no there, Rick. He says, I'm telling you, there's 20 footballs here. He went, look, he says, one, two, three, four, five, six, 17, 18, 19. He says, Tom, what about the one under your arm? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and you've got Jim Jeffries, Billy Brown. Billy along there, as he'll tell you, is the brains of the partnership. Billy's a philosopher. Billy notices things. And it was interesting this time because I said to Billy, you know, it's, things happen. What do you think of this? What do you think of that? He says, Robo, when you come into the management side, you've got to notice things. He says, for instance, what's the difference between Stevie Fulton and Elephant? I said, I didn't know Billy. He says, about two stone. <laughs> I thought, aye, right, fair enough. But Jim Jeffries won the cup, brought the cup back to Gorgie, choking at Kano. And, uh, <laughs> I'm only kidding, it's nice to see Paul here. I thought at last he'd broken a long rule that he'd had to drive down Gorgie Road, but he assures me he parked it in Dorai Road. <laughs> but uh, Jim Jeffries, you know Jim Jeffries likes the golf, and we're down at White Kirk one day. Jim dresses apart all the time. He's got the lovely big Pringle on, he's got the trousers, looks apart. And he was standing in the pro shop this day, and the pro said, look, Jim, I've got to go to the toilet. Could you look after the shop? If anybody comes in, just serve them. So if you have any problems, I'll be back in two minutes. So Jim's standing there, next minute, this big American lady walks in. She says, excuse me, sir, are you the local pro? <laughs> the big jet's looking about, and he's like, yes, madam, I am. Can I help you? That's why I'm here, local friendly professional. He says, I've got a problem. He says, well, that's what I'm here for. Just tell me the problem, I'll fix it. He said, I've just been stung by a wasp. He's like, what? He said, I've just been stung by a wasp. He's like, where about? He says, between the first and second holes. He says, your stance is too wide. <laughs> and you go for there to Livingston, Jim Leishman, ho ho, here we go. And he got me in there, we were having negotiations in the summer, and, and Jim Lewis said, oh, boy, she come here, you're getting the management. He said, I take it, you want to be involved? I says, yes, I want to be a management. I've got half a mind to be a manager, Jim. He says, oh, boy, that's all you need. <laughs> and it's strange, you know, they, they come here and the different things. I said that to Jim Lewis when they're doing speeches with him, and he's great, because I said, well, what do I call you now? Do I call you Jim? Is it Mr. Leishman? Is it General Manager? I said, do I call you God? What is it? He says, Rob, there's none of that pomp and ceremony at Livingston Football Club. You can call me anything you want. He says, as long as you're on your knees when you're saying it. <laughs> but to the players, and it's nice to see some old ones here, and I mean old Henry. <laughs> Fantastic servant of hearts, Henry Smith, Neil Berry, etc. Big Craig I've already mentioned. And it was great playing with these boys because they were fantastic football players. Big Al McLaren as well over there. Fantastic football players. And, and the last we had, and there was a great story about Al McDonald. He was walking along the, the Gorgie Road there one day and he was, had problems with the cup tie and he was, he was kicking this can. And he smacked this can, hit the curb and flew right in his hands. It was, it was quite nice. So he gave it a wee rub. Whoosh, this genie appears. And the genie turns out, Lord and Master, or something like that. <laughs> He said, I'll grant you two wishes. He says, two wishes? He says, he says, we've got injury problems with this cup tie. He says, uh, Neil Berry, you'd be appreciating the ligament injuries. Is there any chance I could have Neil Berry back for Saturday? He says, oof, I said, no, I'm going to say, I said, I wish. He says, wishes I can grant miracles, I can't. He? he says, I'll have a look at Neil's knee. So he goes and has a look at Neil's knee, comes back and says, Dolly, I'm sorry. He says, boys, Christian, he's going to be for at least another three months. I told you, miracles I can't, wishes I can grant. He says, but you've still got one wish left. He went, right. He says, uh, he says this boy Wayne Foster. He says, uh, is there any chance of him scoring a goal? He says, hold on, I'll look at Gil's knee again. <laughs> but you get some crackers. I mean, Justin Fashionu. <laughs> you can laugh at this year. I've room in Holland for 10 days. <laughs> Three David Grisham books in the first night. But I said to Fash, we were sitting in the room one night, and I said to Fash, I said, what made you sign for Hearts? He had all these offers, why Hearts? He says, Robo, he says, Sandy Clark sold the club to me by his first comment. He says, about how the way the, the team played. I says, and what did he say? He says, Fash, is quite simple. He says, I want you to get on the end of Craig Levine's long balls, and you get to play with two pricks up front. 
so he signed. And I'll tell you honestly, he got a stick for Sandy Clark because let's say, and might be the uh, pot corner kettle black here, he wasn't really put much effort into his game. <laughs> and Sandy Clark said to him before the game, Fash, if you don't work up a sweat today, I'm going to pull you off at half time. <laughs> By God, was he disappointed when he only got a cup of tea? <laughs> From the sublime to ridiculous, fashion you to Morris Johnson. Oh, ho. A wee more was great, and a great story, Bert Logan was there, and one thing you find about boys who are put in the continent is they get a rub, they like a rub, they like to be looked after. And Bert does the rubs, along with other things, and hanging on it, he does it halves. <laughs> he does the rubs, so we've got an old wooden bench at Tynecastle, and he was rubbing Morris Johnson, and Morris, quite observant, looked at the bench, and there was all these notches on the bench. And Morris said to Bert, he said, what's all these notches for? He said, well, Morris, I don't know if you know this, but I'm actually a bookie, a trade. He says, and the boys are, you know, they like a bet, so we'll have a competition every year to see who's got the biggest piece of tackle, so to speak. And Morris went, who's is that one there? He says, that's Johnny Miller, the Great White Hope. <laughs> he went, who's that two inches in front of him? He says, that's Gary Locke, Locky the Cocky. <laughs> he says, who's that four inches in front of him? He says, that's Big Fash, Big Justin. <laughs> he went, oh, Morris says, oh, listen, Bill, what can you odds will you give me? Because I think I can beat that. Bert says, well, he says, I'm no daft, Morris. Drop your trousers and let's have a look. So Morris duly does the business. Bert looks, being the typical fruit and bookie that he is, he offered them two to one. And Morris says, I'll have 500 pounds on it. Which got Bert a bit worried. Morris stood at the end of the bench, bang, four inches past the longest mark. Turned around to Bert and says, what do you think of that? Bert says, no bad, Morris. He says, there's just one problem, son. He says, you're standing at the wrong end of the fucking table. <laughs> As we say, it's nice to see the boys here. George Stewart, didn't get a mention there. George Stewart, a legendary hip centre half, was once compared to Franz Bettenberg. Compared to Franz Bettenberg, George was shite. <laughs> Big H, the cat. It's not because he was athletic, he just used to shit in the neighbour's garden. It's good, and, and we go on about these things, there's, there's other stuff here, and the referees get a hard time in it, but I remember a great story, Brian McGinley out there, we were playing St Murna Cup tie, and Brian McGinley was usual being very unbiased towards Harps. <laughs> and I remember roughly turning and saying, McGinley, you're nothing but a wanker. He says, that may be so, Mr Robertson, but if you're not careful, you'll be an excellent prick getting tossed off. <laughs> And a great story with my debut for Newcastle on my, my little holiday <laughs> was against Wimbledon and I got kicked lumps out of you, ladies and gentlemen. Kicked lumps out by a big Wimbledon staff called Eric Young, now plays with Crystal Palace. He's got a big band, big white band, big colours, I must say, put your lumps at me all night. And Willie McFall jumps out of the dugout late on the game and says, Rob, I've got to take you off. I said, Willie, just give me one chance to kick him. Just, I just want one kick at him and he can take me off. So at St James' Park there's a wee bit of runway off the pitch, so I've chased up there, I've used my legendary pace <laughs> to make sure he arrives just in front of me. <laughs> and gave him a wee shove, he's been doing the track, he's been doing the grass along the track, smacked in the ball board. I says, take that you dusky skinned young gentleman you. <laughs> and I thought that was a mistake, because he got up, there was only one eye, the band was over here, all red ash cut, I thought, oh no. But being the brave little striker that I was, I immediately hurtled in the middle of the park, stood next to the referee. <laughs> and there a young come charging across, he says, you little fat bugs, I'm going to rip your head off and shit down your neck. I turned to the referee and says, did you hear that, Mr. Referee? He says, John, I did. He says, but I think he was talking to you. <laughs> As I said, I'm not going to bore you much longer, but it's great for you to be here. The, the Harps Street development, obviously, is development at all clubs. is very important. I mean, we know Billy and, and Jim Jeffries have not got, or not got any money to spend at all, so it's important that Harps continue to rear their own talent. And uh, it's a good cause, and it's one that should be put everywhere in every club. And I'm delighted to see people turn up here in numbers to support the event. I know how much hard work goes into it. 
and I know Hearts have got a lot of good young talent coming through. So keep it up, keep up the good work. And I'll, I'll finish with a story that happened yesterday. It was incredible, and it shows you just how fragile life as a footballer can be. Because we were at the Allo match, 1-3-1, one, one, scored a goal, lasted 70 minutes, I was feeling quite chuffed with myself. And I was walking out the door, and the wee Allo mascot was there with his father. And I said to the father, I asked him if he enjoyed his day, and he says, yes, John, it's been a fantastic day, I really enjoyed it. And I ruffled the b-boy and said, did you enjoy it? He says, yeah, I did, but my team got beat. I said, don't worry, you'll win next week. And as I was walking out the door, I heard the b-boy turn to his dad and said, Dad, who's that? <laughs> his dad said, son, he says, that used to be John Robertson. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. There's some quality speakers still to come. Thank you. Hi, Robert. I'll fucking hang around you now. John, I know you came along today thinking you were just to make an after dinner speech in need of funds for the youth development. But actually, we man, this is your life. At this point, it's normal for introduce the family, so I would like to ask Tracy, Mark, Liam, and Scott to come up, please. I'm sure you were sitting in the background listening to Robbo slaughter me in particular. So at this time I would like to ask you if there are any sexual secrets you have about the email. He says he doesn't. He says he Dinner, you noticed that we had the Edinburgh's version of the Torval and Dean's parent who had the Mr. Eric Milligan, who is a famous and renowned heart supporter. And Eric, Eric, I'm sure you have a few words you'd like to say about Robo. So if I could ask you to come up, please. Bert, for heart supporters who are roughly about my age, John Robertson will never be forgotten. <laughs> brought, up, brought up in the 1950s and 60s when beating Hibs was easy peasy. <laughs> we then witnessed a period of time when the traditional Edinburgh top dog, us, became the Edinburgh underdog. And for the years between the late 1960s, right through the 1970s, it's fair to say that people like Douglas Crome and Paul Kane had a lot of celebrations. And we heart supporters just kept buying maroon handkerchiefs. Those of you who came to Tank Castle at the time when we became the Edinburgh Yo-Yo Club between the Premier League and the First Division, and having yo-yoed, we didn't even get back on one occasion. That was the blackest period in the history of this football club. Many people wondered whether this club was going to go part-time. There was a famous Hearts supporter who was a prominent Scottish columnist who actually asked the question as to whether the ground out there should be turned into a car park. And when I see the state of the pitch, maybe it wasn't far wrong. <laughs> These were bad times. I don't want to recall the players that played for us at that time, but it's fair to say they didn't thrill us very often. And then, at the darkest time, in the early 80s, a young boy 
not long out of Portobello School, burst on the scene at Tyne Castle. You remember that in that first season, when we were in the lower league, John played about 20 games and John scored over 20 goals. But the next season, we took our place back in the Premier League. And John had to do it against the big boys. There's a world of difference, as our colleagues at Easter Road will find out. Scoring goals in the lower league is <laughs> against scoring goals in the Premier League. When John scored his first Premier League goal for the Hearts at Tynecastle, those of you who are here to witness it will never, ever forget it. Who was it against? You guessed it, the Edinburgh Hibernian. First derby of the season, we were the underdogs again. Game started, Hibs were not a very good team then, but they thought a lot better than us. They went ahead, won nothing for the Hibs, and they were the bookies' favourites. And Henry Smith, who's with us, took one of his very, very long kicks up the field. Everybody who knows anything about football knows that very little ever comes out of these long kicks from Henry Smith up the field. But on this occasion, the ball landed near where John Robertson was, and he was covered by two Hibs defenders. In a simple movement, John killed the ball with one foot, turned and crashed a ball past Alan Ruff that Alan Ruff did not see until it came out of the net. Alan Ruff's confidence was shattered. The Hibs' confidence was shattered. They did actually manage on that day to score another goal and made it 2-1 for them. And then there was just a second of hesitancy in their defence. And like lightning, John Robertson burst in and put another ball in their net. The start of John Robertson tormenting the Hibs took place on that first occasion when John Robertson scored a Premier League goal. And for those who want to know the final score that day, we won 3-2. And it's fair to say that Hibs have never been favourites to beat us in any game since then. <laughs> and John Robertson, of course, went on to prove that his scoring goals against the Hibs was not something that was just a novelty. Because he scored 27 goals in derbies between the Hearts and the Hibs. And that was out of a total of 310 first-team goals for the Hearts Football Club. A record, I put to you, that will never be equaled by any player, no matter how grand, in the future of the Hearts Football Club. 310 goals in these years for the Hearts. <laughs> and just as he stored his first Premier League goal for Hearts against the Hibs, those of you who are as keen as I am on these Occasions will recall that the last Premier League goal John Robertson scored was also against the Hibs. <laughs> You'll also, of course, be aware that the last time he came out for the Hearts, the last time he was picked for the team, was the occasion when Hearts won the Cup after 42 years. And we're delighted that the Scottish Cup is here when John Robertson is having this tribute painting. John Robertson will never be forgotten by Hearts supporters because, frankly, John Robertson means a lot more to us than just a Hearts player. John Robertson is a Tynecastle talisman, and that's why he's so special, and that's why all Hearts fans love John Robertson. The player, the man, the personality. He's given us more pleasure than anybody else over the last 40 years. John, that's why we love you. All the best, John Robertson. Thank you very much, Eric. And now, John, I would like to go back a wee bit because I remember my own first meeting with you. <laughs> Fifteen years ago, after Pilmo Smith, the ex-vice chairman, invited George McNeil and myself along to improve the speed and upper body fitness at Tyne Castle. <laughs> it was an experience I will never forget. I was in about the third day of coaching and I was giving the squad some particularly hard running. And the one thing that footballers hate is hard running. When I overheard that fateful stage whisper, which was to cut deeply into my heart and my feelings. That wee fat bastard. <laughs> I was terribly hurt, so you can imagine my relief, John, 
when I turned round and saw you standing there and immediately realised it was you they were talking about <laughs> and not me. <laughs> Could I ask Moira, George, Marlon, Jan, Chris and Heather to come up please? I'd like to take you back to the wee story when he was well, he's never been a very big person, you know. <laughs> but there was one time when like, my mother was always fed up with getting her kitchen window broken, you see, because the boys flying through. We, we used to get soup with bits of glass in it and things like that, you know. <laughs> but uh, there was one particular time myself, Chris, and John were at the back knocking the ball about and everything, you know. And the ball flew through the window as per normal. But the wee man couldn't get over the fence, me and Chris couldn't like, you know, we were off there. <laughs> so my father come out like, well, no, you hear my mother screaming in the kitchen, are you going to get me back and tell So they still. <laughs> so my dad come out like, you know, and of course the wee man standing there, he couldn't get over the fence, and he's got the petty lip. And he said, what my father says to him, he says, what have I tell you? Okay? And he's, he's like, what? What do you mean? He says, what have I tell you? And he says, what? He says, kick me a left fucking fit. <laughs> 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 I know you have from the kitchen, but, oh, that's got to do a lot of work and good life, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> well, thank you very much from the Robertson family. Thank you. <laughs> I, would, I would now like to take you back to April 75, when at 11 years old you played for Parsons Green Primary School in the primary school board cup final against Sight Hill. Score, Parsons Green five, Sight Hill three. Hat-trick hero was none other than yourself. Team captain, none other than David Bowman. He then went on to represent Edinburgh Primary Schools 11 in a team that included David Bowman, Gary Mackay, and Gordon Marshall. And we now, John, have a message here from Tom Rosebury on audio tape actually, who was the deputy head teacher at Clermiston School and formerly of the Edinburgh Schools Football Association. Hello John, Tom Rosebury here. My first sighting of you was as a young teacher when I took an excellent team from Morden Primary School over to Dunningston to play against Parsons Green in a primary school's cup tie. You were a member of that Parsons Green team, a very small member of it. However, your lack of height stood for nothing. You gave a marvellous display of skill, endeavour and marksmanship and helped dump us out of the cup. Shortly after that, I was invited to assist in selecting and coaching the Edinburgh Primary School Select Team. My memory of the young Parsons Green striker was still fresh in my mind and I had you penciled into the Edinburgh team before the trials even took place. You were a model member of that Edinburgh team. You were easy to coach, hard-working and well-disciplined. It was a fine team. And we went on to the final of the Wilson Trophy, the Scottish Cup for primary schools. You played your part well, and we lifted the cup, and you picked up your first Scottish Cup winner's medal. I watched your footballing progress with great interest from then on. And when yourself and some fellow members of that Edinburgh team began to emerge as young players with hearts, I began to go along to watch the reserve team games. This led to me changing my football affiliations, and I became a staunch Hearts fan. It was therefore with great delight that I watched at Celtic Park in May of last year as you stepped forward to receive your Scottish Cup winner's medal. No one deserved it more. Thank you for the many years of pleasure your play has given me, John. Enjoy your special day, and my best wishes for the future go to you and your family. Also, John, from that same era, we have a man from Portobello High School here today who would like to pay his own tribute, Mr. Charlie Tullock. <laughs> How 
How did you rate John, Charlie? Ned, I'd just like to say three things. I think John was the best schoolboy football player that I'd ever seen before. By the way, I'm used to 30 people, not 300, but, um, but three things disappointed me. One was that he left school and didn't take his hires, which would have been nice if he'd passed that. The second thing was that he, he actually left the, the football team and therefore didn't play in the Scottish Cup semi-final, which we lost and we would have won the Scottish Cup. And you've always worked to win the Scottish Cup, I think, is that right? And the third thing was we played golf at Dunningston and I shot 82 off about eight um, on a really bad day and I lost 10 and 8 to John who shot 71. <laughs> I've never, never lost 10 and 8 to anybody in golf. This week, personally. <laughs> Okay. Thank you very much, Charlie. Now, John, a word from one of your school day pals who played in the same team as yourself at Parsons Green Primary, also at Portobello High School, the Edinburgh Schools, and the Scotland Youth Team in then Harps. He then went on to play for Coventry and Dundee United in Scotland, and also happens to be the only player in my time at Tynecastle who is actually dirtier than yourself. <laughs> yes, you've guessed it, David Bowman. something nasty. <laughs> I've, known, I've known John for a long time now. Too long for a lot of people. Uh, what can I really say about him that everybody knows the amount of goals that he scored. I think I started at primary school. He scored 13. I was booked. <laughs> So it's not really much changed since then. <laughs> I'd also like to say five of his goals came off the backside of somebody else. <laughs> he did claim them. <laughs> it's not unusual. I'd like to say to John, Tracy, the kids, I mean, it's been a great pleasure to watch. I watched them a long time. And for somebody to score the amount of goals he has, I mean, I'd take my hat off for you. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. As we move on, John, to 1976, you become a member of Salvas and Boys Club, and you manage to win the league, and we're also cup winners, going through the season undefeated. And from those days at Salvas we have Keith Wright, the former Hibernian footballer, and his father, Harry, who actually happened to run you and your father to the Dinah Hibbs games. <laughs> I believe you were, had the reason to be thankful to John for passing on some valuable advice to you. That's right, Bert. Uh, when I was fortunate in 1992, I got called on an international team, and John was the experienced international at the time. Uh, so the, <laughs> the, wee man, <laughs> the wee man gave me great advice, you know, helped me along and uh, kept me right. But when I think about it now, uh, the advice the wee man gave me was shite. <laughs> because I never, ever got asked back. <laughs> No, seriously, uh, I've known John a, a long, long time. Uh, I played against him and Bo. I was at Green Dykes, John was at, I was at Green Dykes, John was at Parsons Green. Played against them. But, uh, we actually played in the same team at Dinah Hibs. It was myself, Yogi, and John and the team. We scored 100 goals between us that year. John played sweeper and scored 98. <laughs> so, <laughs> but as Bo says, it's been a pleasure to play alongside him at Dinah Hibs, even though he's a year older than me. He was always a, a, a well, he went senior by Hearts at 16. I didn't go senior until I was older, but he, the wee man was always the one I could ask for advice, and uh, I'm delighted to be here today, and wish John and Tracy all the best and the kids. 
Thanks very much. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Harry. And now, John, another guest who, if I can describe, is probably the only player who is dirtier than you and Dave Bowman put together. <laughs> yes, Kano, it's your turn. <laughs> some memories with, uh, as regards to a place called Cavalry Park. I do, uh, it goes back a long time, but the day that I hate to say this, just sure I fucking hate to say it. The day they won the cup. <laughs> All right, I can get it now. Two days later on, I phoned the wee man, I said, wee man, well done, absolutely delighted for you. Fucking man, the phone. <laughs> but I'm still waiting on the telephone call, if it goes back. And Bo, you might remember us. We used to play World Cup, Friday night, Calvary Park. There was Ido, Jazz, yourself and Bo. Fucked a lot of them. <laughs> Won the World Cup medal. Wait, did I get a fucking phone call? No. <laughs> so we won. If you want to phone me at the house, I'll be waiting on it. <laughs> but uh, no, different class guy, different class family. But one time I did see him happy him when he got the Scottish Cup is when he had these wee girls in his wee girl in his hands. And different class. Good family. Thanks very much, Paul King. It's a tribute to your father Rab John that his three sons have all appeared on the Hallowed Wembley Turf. Two of them, Chris and John as successful playing stars. And the third one, George, who I'm told is a very keen gardener. <laughs> George came home with some of the Wembley turf after one of the internationals and tried to relay it in Edinburgh. On September 10th, you sign an S forum. And some of the details on the S forum read as follows. Chairman, Archie Martin. Manager, Bobby Moncar. Assistant manager, Tony Ford. Reserve team coach, Ian Boobs-Brown. I put the boobs in myself, that was <laughs> actually on that. We have boobs here today, John. I'm sure he'll, he'll, he'll have something to say about you. When you go, boobs, and remember I said, two minutes, not 20. Okay. First of all, I don't know why I'm standing here, by the way, because the trouble that this little bugger gave me over the years, hence the hair still. Seriously, go back to one game. It was a reserve team game at the illustrious Greenock Morton. We left Town Castle, 11 o'clock in the morning, nice and sunny. We get through to Greenock, it's pushing the rain. <laughs> Big game for the troops. This guy, 15 and a half year old, I kid you not. Lazy little bugger. <laughs> the game proceeds 2 0 down the tubes. Half time we came in, sat down, we had a cup of tea together. He says, John, you have to work a wee bit harder, son. And he gave me the, the Robertson look. And I said, I'm, I'm planning to go across, son, and try and close off fullbacks and what have you. He says, Baby, I'm not fucking here today. I'm here to score goals. <laughs> I says, John, it's part and part, parcel of the game, son. You've got to do that. All credit to him. Second half, 2 0 down. Boom. We won the game 5-2. Guess who scored the hat-trick? John Lawrence. At the end of the game, he walked off. He looked at me as if to say, what do you think of that, you old fat? <laughs> 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 
that was the days when he had the old hairstyle with the tints in it and all that, you know? He's actually, Tracy's got the same kind of hairstyle in it. <laughs> Superb wee man. You don't need to be told he was a fantastic footballer. And to see what he'd done in the game was magnificent. An old guy like myself, I've been fortunate as a Hearts fan. I saw the whole shebang. I go back to Willie Bald. I like young guys like that. Jimmy Warto, this man is every wonder equal. And I'd like to say to you, thanks for listening. And to John Robertson, thank you very much, son, for the pleasure of watching you play for you. Thank you, Bruce. Also in that same form, John, the position of secretary reads L.W. Porteous. Everyone knows as Les. And Les is here today accompanied by the former vice chairman and a man responsible for the development of the youth policy at Tyne Castle and now chairman of Lothian Regional Transport, Pilmer Smith. Also joining them, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, a man who played his part via sponsorship in your return from Newcastle to the Jambos, Ramesh Daha. I'll hand the microphone over to you. Thanks very much, Bert, and I came along here. I was delighted to come along and say something about John, but after the speeches that have been made, what else can anybody say about John? I think the Lord Provost said most of it, but uh, what I did intend to say, and Boops said some of it uh, just, just now, was that I think on behalf of everybody here and all Hearts supporters, you would want me to thank John for all the enjoyment he's given us over the years and to wish he and Tracy and the kids all the best in the future. Thank you, Thank you Tomer. Also, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to read a letter that Les Porteous has penned. And I'll just let the boys settle down then before I read it. Rather than say it, Les feels much happier putting pen to paper, John. This is John Robertson, I would invite you to cast your mind back to the first team, April 1989. The game's at Tynecastle Park against another Edinburgh team. The score is 1-1, and Tosh McKinley crosses the ball into the box. John Robertson misses the, the cross com completely with his head. The ball strikes Snedden, breaks back to John, and he scores. This, of course, is the final score, and John is once more our hero. During this period in the club's history, Monday was invariably a day off, and it, and it was expected after a derby win. However, the players who had injuries were expected to turn up for treatment. There were other players who found excuses to turn up at the ground. These players were usually avoiding some task at home. <laughs> One course of action was guaranteed to enter the treatment room, and that was an invitation to our hero, Robbo, to describe the winning goal. I think it was fair to say that his fellow professionals had become rather wary of being in the room when the story started, as John tended to utilise a long, descriptive, drawn-out method of storytelling. Much to the disgust of the injured professionals, a young ground staff boy gave our man his opening, and the story began, to a packed treatment room. Sure enough, the numbers began to dwindle as the blow-by-blow -blow account progressed. <laughs> The excuses of the people leaving became more bizarre. John was never a man to take you into a story halfway, and this particular account began with his pre-match meal. <laughs> the room continued to empty as the story rumbled ever nearer to the incident. I became aware that we were alone in the treatment room. I would never attempt to emulate John as a storyteller, but I will attempt to pick out the highlights of his account. John stated that he had missed the first cross because the sun was shining through a hole in the North Grandstand roof. <laughs> the sun had caused the initial problem, and his goal had been made all the more difficult by a large flock of seagulls, which had a habit of descending on the ground to devour any discarded pies. <laughs> Those of you that know the geography of the ground will have spotted one or two difficulties with the version, as offered by John. 
Tom Watson will tell you that the sun did not cause problems at that time of the year in the North Stand, and at that time in the afternoon the weather was not bad enough to drive seagulls inland. <laughs> However, the version offered by John was far more entertaining than a simple admission that he had missed the ball the first time. <coughs> I considered it an honour and a privilege to listen to such stories, especially exploits against Hibernian, and I personally could never understand the small audiences for such tales. I have never fully understood when a hero becomes a legend. I do know that John Robertson is well along this path and such status will be richly deserved. I do hope you have a pleasant day and enjoyable day, John. <laughs> Ironically, it is in November 81 that the present manager, Jim Jeffries, leaves Hearts to sign for Berwick Rangers. You make your first team debut on Wednesday, February 17th versus Queen of the South at Tyne Castle with a scoreline of 4-1. Brother Chris makes his 50th appearance for Hearts in the same game. And Chris, I'd like you to come up and recall and tell us how you encouraged John to become a member of the Hearts staff. already we said that uh, John had a chance to go down south and sing for a few clubs and um, he was only a young lad at the time and I thought, I come from a big family, going down south, seen him before, kids go down there, six months later they're homesick and, and they're, they're sent back north, you know. So at the time, I don't know if it was mentioned, but John was actually training with the Hibs and uh, me being a jambo, I thought, I, can't, I didn't want to see him scoring goals for the Hibs against the Hearts, you know, and um, I thought, um, Wally Gibson was coming to end his career. Uh, I was there as well, and I was shite. <laughs> uh, and, um, well, I was always injured, actually. That was, I've got dodgy knees. Uh, so Wally Gibson was coming to end his career. I was always on the treatment table, and Gary Little was shite. <laughs> so I thought, there's a big chance if he comes to the hearts, you know, we'll maybe get a game. 600 games later, 310 goals. I think I made no bad decision. <laughs> the only downside, I got fucking free. <laughs> Maybe the wrong decision. Anyway, uh, people come up to me and they say to me, you know, uh, I heard that, by the way, you know, I was not a bad goal scorer, you know, but I heard that uh, when you were younger, you know, you were a better goal scorer, you scored more goals. Well, I just want to put the record straight. It's fucking true. <laughs> I was just a wee bit unlucky. <laughs> anyway, um, people always used to say to me, you know, you must be a wee bit envious, John, you know, because, you know, you were at the hearts and you never made it, never really had a career, basically. And, um, <laughs> it's true, though. <laughs> well, I got a Scottish Cup medal before that wee bastard. <laughs> That's the difference. And uh, I can't remind him of it, you know. And, um, but I've never been envious of John. I, got, I actually got the best next thing. I was never able to, to lift the Scottish Cup for, for hearts. Something I always wanted to do, to do myself. But I got the second best. I, I was able to watch my young brother play 600 games, 300 goals, and win the Scottish Cup for, for hearts. And if you can't do it yourself, the best next, the next thing is for your young brother to do it. I'm a very proud brother tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. As I said earlier, John, the club had a new owner at that time, and I would like to call on now Mr. Wallace Mercer to say a few words. years. <laughs> if you look at it quite brutally, it's about scoring goals and winning games. We did have a minor breach in our relationship towards the early 80s, late 80s, and we sold John for I think 625,000 to Newcastle. 
it became obvious within six months that that was not going to work for either party. So we paid three quarters of a million to buy them back, and I think that's still a club record. Hearts in those days, and they still are, is all about players, quality players and looking after players. John Robertson, for all our domestic disputes, was a great contributor to the club. He annoyed certain centre forwards occasionally, but pound for pound he was a great contributor. It's nice to see you, Tracy, the children, and John here, and it's thoroughly deserved. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. John, I would need to say that Wall is saying that pound for pound you were the best ever. It's going a wee bit over the score. <laughs> now at this juncture, John, I would now like to introduce some of Tracy's family, namely Brother Stuart and Uncle Willie and Auntie Edith. early visits to your house? Well, I do. Um, you'll have to excuse me, this is the first time I've actually done any public speaking. Uh, I feel a bit like Sam on Rushdie when the doorbell goes. <laughs> uh, I've, uh, I'm just admiring John's attire there. Um, I thought it was uh, the Harps Tartan, and I asked somebody at the bar, was it Harps Tartan? They said, don't be so damn, the checks are far too big. <laughs> Honestly, um, Tracy and John got together about 81, 82, and uh, first met John in coasters. Um, you probably remember that horrible top you had on. It was a, a white arm knitted sweater. <laughs> now, everybody uh, sort of acknowledges John as being a, a, a very um, very public figure now, and all the trappings that go with it. Um, I remember him when he was a bit more scant. <laughs> I can remember particularly looking at a pair of shoes he had, and uh, the leather on the soles was that thin, he could put his foot on a 50 pence piece and tell if it was heads or tails. <laughs> At the, time, at the time now, John couldn't actually afford to have a car. And I had an old Mini, it was an old wrecker car. But anyway, a Mini 850, a beige one. A bit like Neil Berry's top, but in better condition. <laughs> so, this day, this day, John come to us and he says, can I borrow your car? I want to take Tracy for a run. So they went for a run in the car. And this happened two or three times. And one day he come in and he says, I've got bad news for you. I've had a crash. And he wrote it off. And what had happened was, he'd, he'd gone round the Dean Bridge. And he'd come round the corner, he'd gone up and over the bridge, and the sun had caught my eye, apparently. And, and he, hit, he hit the high curb. There was very big high curbs there. So anyway, they hit, they hit the curb, and the front end of the car went one way, and the back end split and went the other way. So then Jim was sitting in one gutter, and he was sitting in the other gutter. Now, he may be well known for scoring goals, but he's not fucking good at taking corners, I can tell you that. But anyway, that's enough for me. I'd just like to say it's been an absolute privilege to enjoy for so many years. And I hope that if he's half as successful in his managerial career as he's been as a player, he'll do not bad. So thanks very much. Thank you. Well, joining me right now is former Jambo Jimmy Bone, now manager with Dundee. Jimmy, welcome. Hi, how are you doing, Scott? I'm very well, thank you. Excellent. When I say to you, John Robertson, what springs to mind? Um, well, I think the first thing that springs to mind is that uh, I remember the picture Alan McDonald had painted to me when I, I joined Hearts. He said, well, with this uh, young striker who can score a goal, and what we're looking for is that we would like you to provide the head and we'll use his young legs. But uh, very quickly after being at Tynecastle, uh, it turned out to be the other way. And is there any other player that you would compare Robbo with? No, I think that's a very difficult I think is he's, he's very, very unique, um, you know, because he's, he's a clever footballer outside the box and uh, he's definitely a predator and, you know, he's got this wonderful ability that, you know, he can bend them, he can, he can chip them or, you know, he can go for power. Um, knowing that uh, he's a one-off, you know, I don't think there's anybody I would compare him with, no. Do you rate him as an inspiration to younger players? I think he's a real inspiration and uh, the thing about it is that he did really well for somebody that didn't run about. 
Well, unfortunately, you can't be with them tonight. Is there a message you'd like to put? Yeah, uh, yes, it's, um, I'm disappointing I can't make it, but uh, what I would say to them is that just watch what he's eating. You know, <laughs> he's been carrying a wee bit away for a wee while, so I think you should watch what he's eating and drinking. Uh, why should he change the habits of a lifetime, I suppose? <laughs> well, if he gets any bigger, he'll need to settle wheels when he gets around. <laughs> Jim, on behalf of everybody, thanks very much indeed for that. Sorry you can't be with them uh, on the night, but uh, good luck for the rest of the season. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Then on to the 8-5, to 8-6 season. And we have a new signing in the shape of John Colhoun. I will never forget the young Gary Locke who was on the ground staff at the time. And as we all know, Locke is a fervent heart supporter. And when he heard we had signed John Cahoon and how much we had, he had cost the club, his young innocent, innocent words were, and I quote, Fuck, we could have got Joe Muller for that money. <laughs> I have to tell you that Jai C made his young life a misery for weeks to come. It's a pleasure now to introduce some members of the 86 squad. John Colhoun. <laughs> Craig Levine. Andy Bruce. Alan McLaren. Neil Berry. And Henry Smith. you have a few words you'd like to say about the wee Ian? Yeah, it's been a great pleasure to be here today. I heard two things I thought I would never hear again in my life. John Robertson speechless and a rousing reception for Wallace Mercer. <laughs> Both of which are well overdue, so that's a, the plan Chris, you go away for 10 years and come back. I would just like to say that, um, for all Andy says, it was a pleasure to play with John Robertson. It was great when you worked for 90 minutes, crossed the ball over, Robbo stand there with not a bead of sweat in his brow, nodding it in, you pick up the paper, Robbo does it again for the hearts. <laughs> but it's been a great pleasure, it's been a great pleasure to know him as a, a footballer, to play with him as a footballer, and also to know him as a personal friend. And the thing about the club at that time was that we could all stand up here, a lot closer to John Robertson's weight now, <laughs> and uh, to say that we're all friends and to meet up again, these are great. It's a great club and the wee man made it proud and he is a legend and I'd just like to say thank you very much for the, the time you gave playing with you. I very, uh, hope you do have a great life for the rest of your life and thank you very much. Thank you, John. We'll pass over to Craig with me. Yes, Craig, I believe you have a wee message for John. Yes, I, I, I've actually got a telegram here. <laughs> you thought I didn't have one, eh? <laughs> and it says, um, I hope you have a shite day. <laughs> That's from Ray Stewart. <laughs> I said, John, honestly. <laughs> you know what? I, I, I sat at the table there and I wondered. I sat and I wondered and I thought, 
Many goals against the Hibs. 27 goals against the Hibs. What if he'd been a heart supporter? <laughs> John might not remember this. I, I was thinking. I was thinking. That park is bad, eh? <laughs> the fucking tractors never run it. They weren't good to score. <laughs> if Ray doesn't want you next year, man, the blue is off. I thought back and I thought, what can I say about John? And it's, it's going to be said tonight, there's a testament to John, the type of people who are coming up here to talk about him are people that I know and I respect. <coughs> people like Sir Paul Kane, who is a hip supporter. And I think he deserved your applause because he turned up here, Keith Wright turned up here, hips players, to honour somebody who is not about anything other than football. And that's what John Robertson's all about. <laughs> Let me say, I, I thought to myself, what can I say about John? And I thought back and I thought, the first time I met John, he'll not remember this. This is, this is true. 1982, Somerset Park. I'm, at, I'm going there, I'm at Cowdenbeath. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm better than this. I know I'm fucking back there, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, and, I, and I've got the list of people in the trial for the Scotland team, under 18s. Now I'm, I'm thinking, counting beef, I can, I can play at a higher level. And I look at the team, and I see the young lad Robertson, and I say, I hope he's playing against me. This is because he's, he's sharp, but I'm quicker than He's no bad in the air, but I'm taller. He's tricky, but I'm trickier than him. And I thought to myself, if, if, if I pick the two teams, it's the final qualifier for the under-18 Scotland team, I hope I get Robertson. What a fucking mistake that was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm embarrassed. They all went through my legs, they went this side, they went that side. I ended up pulling up my hamstrings. <laughs> and people talk about John Roberts, and I remember that first moment at Somerset Park, and I think he's going to make it. And I said, I'll need to get the hearts and play alongside him. <laughs> but forget about him as a player, and the most important thing, and everybody who knows him, is a lovely guy. And that's all I can say about him. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. And thank you to the 86 squad. <laughs> it's also a marvellous thing, John and Tracy, that you're both patrons of a cancer research group by the name of CLAS, which stands for Children with Cancer and Leukaemia, Advice and Support for Parents and I'm sure that they are delighted to have people like you two represent and help them in their fundraising. <laughs> and now, John, it's a pleasure to introduce a representative from class, Valerie Simpson. John, John Robertson, the footballer, I have it, because I don't know anything about football for a start. If you ask me how many goals he'd ever scored, I couldn't tell you. But I can tell you it's not half as many parents and children that he's touched since he came along on board with the clasp. Tracy as well. He goes into the hospital, he visits the children, he helps fundraise so the children can have treats and days out, picnics, parties, everything. And that's the John Robertson that I've come here to honour tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. Just stay there, Valerie, please. 
Valerie, if you would just stay here. Because, John, it gives me immense pleasure also to inform you that Tracy has decided that the fee you earn for your earlier after dinner speech <laughs> should now be presented to Valerie. Valerie, check that. <laughs> we now have a tape message drawn from a man who signed for hearts toward the end, towards the end of his career. A man who would probably weigh about eight stones soaking wet and yet would tackle with the ferocity of a Dave Mackay. A marvellous player and a marvellous guy, David McCreary. Well David, well, David McCreary joins me right now. Dave, what's your earliest memories of John Robertson? Oh, well, I've got this window when he came down to, to uh, Newcastle. Um, obviously, we, we got very, very close, uh, and his wife, uh, Tracy, and my wife, Julia, obviously uh, went about together. Uh, but a lovely lad. <laughs> now, if I, I said to you, we did the word association, and I said the words to you, John Robertson, what would be the one overriding memory? For myself, uh, or Rob, <laughs> um, Oh really? Uh, I think it, it, it was the no. Oh, what kind of what kind of? Oh, just there was so many, you know, on our trips away with Newcastle and whatever. Just uh, he's a little character. <laughs> He's a little fat character. A little fat character, yes, yes. Don't yes. worry, I, I can't... I don't think he is now, is he? Well, no, he's, he's shed a few pounds now because he has to show a good example to the younger lads. Well, I'm probably farther than him now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and is there one pattern word that you'd like to say to him? I think it's just, I'm, I'm sorry, John, I can't be there, obviously, uh, but uh, have a, a lovely time. You know, you just thoroughly deserve it, and you've got into your managing career in football. And it's a case, just treat people the way you, you'd like to be treated yourself. But have a lovely night and uh, love to Tracy. Great, Dave. Thank you very much indeed. No problem. I hope to see him soon. Brilliant. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. Thank you, David McCreary. Many things happened with John, most of them good things. But I remember we had one problem. And it was the day that John and Tracy got married. And I was sitting in the service in the church in Morningside. And after the service, they two went into the, the vestry to do the business. <laughs> Sandy Clark says to me, Bill, the minister wants to see you very quickly. And they went in and I said, what's the problem? He said, well, there seems to be a bit of confusion here. Tracy's hoping to sign for life, but John wants a three-year deal with a three-year option. <laughs> I also remember when John came back from Newcastle, I have to tell you that for the six months that he was down there, I received a nightly phone call. And it was to the effect that our heart's going to take me back. And then one night I got a phone call from Wallace Mercer. I was in the bath, my wife brought the phone in. Wallace said to me, Bill, does that wee monkey want to come back here? I said, yes. He says, give me 10 minutes. Of course, the deal was done. And you also mentioned the fact that Rami's sponsored John on his return and I had long serious negotiations with Rames as to what he required from John Robertson for his sponsorship. So eventually I said to John we've done a deal with Hearts and I've also done a deal with Rames about the sponsorship. John says what does it entail? I said well you have to do four public appearances, is that a problem? He says no, of course it's not. He says by the way it's in fucking Baru. <laughs> Anyway, I'd just like to say finally, it's been absolutely tremendous joy to be associated with you and Tracy. I did say to you when you left to go to Livingston, in my view, you're only there on loan. I think that sometime in the years to come, you will return to Tyne Castle in some capacity. Thanks, John. Thank you very much, Bill McMurdo. Actually, Bill covered the next paragraph on uh, the Newcastle era, John, so I'll just skip that now. I think now it would be appropriate, John, to introduce the former chairman of Hibernian FC, Mr. Douglas Crone. Also at this time, I was going to invite another famous hippie up, a Mr. John Leslie. But if you got today's news of the world, John could not make it. He's been otherwise engaged with three young nymphettes. <laughs> I 
I just like to say that it's an honour and a pleasure to be here sharing the platform with John Robertson. I know that all you heart supporters here, thinking that John belongs to you. John doesn't just belong to you, John belongs to football. I've always admired John, admired the way he plays. He's a great man, great family. John, all the best, good luck in your future, whatever it may be. Thank you very much, Douglas. I think it's always different lives for us. We see John in a different light, uh, but it's really pleasing when we come here and see you know, the turnout he gets and also the ex -Hips players and managers. In fact, I think Jim Duffy was going to be here today, but he's actually in the hospital having a mole removed from his penis. His wife's about upset because she thought he'd given up all that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sorry. I think my wife's just went underneath that table up there. <laughs> it's not Jim Duffy anyway. I'll, anyway, I'll let Doogie have a word with me. Thanks. Well, as many of you know, I'm a, a blue nose, which won't go down well in these quarters, but uh, I remember an infamous occasion that uh, John and I went to Ibrox. Unfortunately, he wasn't playing in the time. Uh, we went through to see an old firm match, uh, Ranger Celtic. And John had a wee freebie ticket for one of the boxes where we free swally and a drink and whatever. And I had my season ticket to go and stand with my boy. And Robbo said, do you want to swap? Well, I had it in my pocket as soon as he said it because I'm, as many of you know here, I'm not adverse to taking a wee freebie like tonight. Uh, so Robbo says, right, well, I'm going to go in the govern stand. So he went there with my wee laddie, 12 year old, and I went up and uh, wined and dined up in the, the stand. And it was tremendous. That was a swelling, but not the game. And I thought to myself afterwards, well, I better give you the wee man a wee chance to recover because going in amongst the bears in the govern stand must be a daunting experience for a wee jambo. Because bear in mind, over the years, he's been referred to as a wee fat bastard. Uh, and another wee F bastard as well, uh, Fenian and that, uh, but uh, far be it for me to say that. So I thought, well, let's give him another half an hour after the game to recover from the, the wee bit incident, because no doubt he wouldn't have been partaking in the communal singing. But there he was, 110 minutes after the game had concluded, there he was, the boys were signing autographs and everything else. And to me, that summed John up. He, he went along with my boy into that govern stand and the guys take him on, they revered him, they admired him, they saw him as what he is, a punter. They never saw him as a wee fat bastard or anything else, that wee bastard that scores every week when he turns up. They admired him and they loved him. And I'll tell you something, that's what I do, I love him as well. And I'll tell you something, you're here to respect him as a legend, a living legend, a professional, a winner, a grafter and everything else. But I'm proud to be associated with the Robertson family and I'm proud to say he's a friend and he's a true pal. Thank you. Well, I'm going to make it short and sweet, John. All I can say is thanks for all the great memories. Good morning. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I wish I was there tonight, Rob, obviously I'm, I'm employed now. And where's the first place they take me? Tenerife. I think I'm extradited from there. I'm not sure I'm allowed back in. But um, I certainly wish I was there tonight. We all had it planned for me to come and give you a wee surprise. But might as well kick that into touch. And they take me to Tenerife. Um, they were going to do one for me and call it This Is Your Wife, but I don't think that would have gone down too well. But seriously, um, hope you have a great night. And all the boys that are there, um, I'm certainly going to miss a good one. But uh, I'll be thinking about you, pal. All the best. Now, John, we have a letter from Darren Jackson, who can't be here today. <laughs> Obviously not got the same balls as Kano. <laughs> anyway, John, the letter reads, Robbo, another record set today. The only person on This Is Your Life to need a high chair. <laughs> on a more serious note, John, hope you have a wonderful time today. 
It's a shame I can't be there to join in the celebrations, but it's a great honour to be invited and to be known as one of your friends. You must be very proud, surrounded by family, friends and fellow sportsmen. And I'm sure they will all join me in toasting the best goal scorers Scotland has ever seen. Give you a call soon, me man, Darren. It's like a heart reunion. Okay, Jim, on you go, mate. And ladies and gentlemen, um, Mr. Uh, you'll get a point, sir, when we win this league. <laughs> uh, Mr. Keenan forces away uh, America, John, so the, the chairman sends his uh, best wishes. But you haven't seen him since he dropped you. <laughs> so, uh, Raymond is at least five games, please, five on Wednesday, John. Um, so Raymond uh, apologises that he's not here as well. Folks, all I can say that. Um, when we're delighted that we've signed John Robertson for Livingston Football Club. John, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if my records are, are correct, but I think I'm near, nearly right. 207 league goals, and his brother Chris mentioned 310 goals in all uh, for Hearts Football Club. Nowadays, uh, you'll never see the likes of that again because of this Bosman rule. You'll never see people that, that play 12, 13, 14 years for one club. So what we're looking at on stage is uh, the last legend uh, Hearts Football Club, John Robertson. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you, fellas. <laughs> oh, sorry, just before I go, I forgot to mention this. I'm at goal number 23 on a Monday morning, and John makes my tea on a Monday, and I'm at goal number 23. Luckily for the Bairns, John puts the boys to their bed and starts telling them about his goals. They only make number two before they fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Thank you, boys. For season 97-98, your last season, you achieve a club record of 213 league goals. The last one fittingly against Hebs on April 11th in a surprise 2-1 defeat at Easter Road. You make your last active appearance against Dunfermline at Tynecastle on May 9th, 1998. But there was to be one more unbelievable experience for you and thousands more on May 16th, 1998. The venue was Celtic Park. The occasion, the Scottish Cup final. The opponents, Glasgow Rangers. John. You're on the subs bench, but I'm sure that you, like the rest of us, gained tremendous confidence as we left the tunnel to be greeted by a massive sea of maroon scarves and hats directly facing us. After only two minutes, Stevie Fulton makes a surgeon run into the heart of the Rangers' defence. <laughs> and is pulled down. Penalty was the cry of thousands, and penalty it was. Up steps Colin Cameron to smash the ball into the back of the net and the dream takes one step closer. Half time arrives and we maintain our lead. Very early in the second half, Stefan Adam nips in to steal the ball. Stefan Adam nips in to steal the ball from a dither in Amoruso and beats Goran <laughs> with an angled shot across the face and into the far corner. A two goal lead and legions of heart supporters are in heaven, only to be cast into hell in the 81st minute when McCoy scores. Those last nine minutes plus will remain the longest nine minutes in any Hearts fan's life. And we survive a heart stopping moment when Big Davy Weir brings down McCoist. <laughs> Referee Willie Young runs towards the box with finger pointing, but to immense relief, he gives a free kick outside the box. 90 minutes comes, and we are left with approximately five minutes overtime to get through. 
In the 93rd minute, Big Jim Jeffries, in that overpowering manner of his, calls to the fourth official. Hey, sir, tell him to blow that whistle. Do you know Ken Hurts haven't won a cup for 36 years? <laughs> 95 minutes come, and the dream is realised. Hearts have their hands on the cup at last, and you, Robbo, are overcome with happiness. After so many disappointments, you finally have a winner's medal, and I can think of no finer way to crown a glorious career. It's now, John, my pleasure to invite some members of the current playing staff onto the stage. Gary Locke, Jim Hamilton, <laughs> Thomas Flugel, Stefan Adan. Slim is sitting at a different table. Sorry, Slim, I didn't spot you. That's because you're dressed in a London jack. I'm glad you're here, Slim, because you have got something to say. Oh, um, I... I don't really want to talk about football. Uh, I've known John for a great number of years. Uh, one of the main reasons for me coming to Hearts initially, apart from Wallace Mercer, <laughs> was my friendship with John, not only with John, but with Tracy. They've been great friends to myself um, throughout my career. I actually feel like part of the family. I actually thought that seat was for me. <laughs> <laughs> This uh, afternoon, early evening, is thoroughly deserved, John. Um, you're a legend, not only in this century, but in the next century to come, and uh, you thoroughly deserve it, and I'm really proud of you. Thank you very much, David. Now, get a lot. I, I can only apologise, I've not got my translator with me today. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see Slim got dressed for the occasion, I don't know. <laughs> uh, just like that. <laughs> Just like to thank Robo eh, for all the advice he's given me over the years. Hopefully I'll still be able to give me it the years to come. Thank Tracy for her lovely breakfast and that on a Sunday morning. <laughs> uh, eh, but all the best, Robo Gorgeston, and thanks very much. Thanks very much, boys. Thank you. At this point, John, I think it would be appropriate to invite your business partner, Jim Brown, to come up and say a few words. And Jim, I believe you have a story relating to some Hamlet cigars. Yeah, well, we had been looking for a pop for about a year, but nothing was coming up, and the ones we did look at, we thought, no, nah, that's not right. Then it happened. Well, it happened for me, anyway, because a pub in Gorgie Road with John. <sighs> And then the season came to an end and John got released. <laughs> the worst thing happened. Hibs were in for him, that was even worse. And I was actually going to speak to Bill McMurdo because I was on more money from Hamlet because I was going to be the next guy in advert who was walking out the pub saying, this is a guy. <laughs> we went to partnership with a Hearts legend two weeks before he signed for Hibs. Thank you very much, John. Ladies and gentlemen, I would now like to invite members of the Federation Committee to come on stage. John Borthwick, the General Secretary. John Long, Muir, the Treasurer. Colin Gasman Mackay. And John Hunter. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, they asked me this afternoon to remember one or two things about watching John Robertson for 18 years. Easter Road, it has to be Easter Road. Hearts getting beat, no, sorry, Hearts drawing 1-1. One, one. We're into injury time. The wee man comes up, belts the ball in the back of the net in injury time, and I remember the statement in the paper, they always said, the game ain't over to the fat man sings. <laughs> That's the man. Thank you, John. Bless you, John. It's been great to watch you. 
I saw Colin Bald and Wardo, I saw all these guys, all the young guys. I used to say, but you never saw the other ones. But I can tell you right now, I've saw them all now. And this wee man here, with what he's done, maybe know when you think of the halfbacks that we had with Mackay, Glidden, Cummins, and the superb guys we had then, but the way John and his young lads, like Bowman, Mackay, they all came through to what this man's achieved, as the boys say, will never be surpassed by a Hearts player. We're greatly honoured, Johnny, that you played for the Hearts Melodian. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, John. Also, gentlemen, I'd like to call on Mr Alec Jones. But before I do so, I'd like to thank Alec for supplying me with all the details regarding Robbo's achievements. Alec, it must have been a huge task. I believe, Alec, that you saw John right at the commencement of his career. Yeah, that's right. I remember John Robertson and uh, a place called Ludda, where he played alongside as a wee laddie, because I was 30 and I think you were about 16, John. Um, and the man who arranged the game was none other than Jim Jeffries. And John was absolutely magnificent that night in a place called Ludda, because that's where he started his arts career. And in the summer time, he played in the Easter Craigs Youth Tournament. And I'm sure, John, you scored the finest goal of your career in the final of that tournament. And I'll never forget that. And also, that year, my club, Dunderhall Hearts Supporters Club, was the first club to sponsor John Robertson for £100. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alec. Thank you, gentlemen. John, you deserve, and I've said this publicly before, to be thought of as one of the all-time greats ever to play for Hearts. You're right up there alongside Willie Bold, Jimmy Warto, guys from an earlier era that um, I can just about remember. Um, your place in the pantheon of Hearts history um, is there and will never be taken away from you. John, tonight, today, is a special day for you. Um, I won't be here this afternoon to join in the celebrations but I say to you have a great day you're amongst friends enjoy yourself and you're always welcome at Bay Castle Green John your mum Jan and the latest addition to the Robertson clan are here today we'd like to ask Jan and Baby Jade to come forward please John and last a wee girl. <laughs> Robbo says she'll have to play in goals. You only have seven more to go now for the team, Robbo. <laughs> I would now like also to ask Tom Watson, the chairman of the Federation, and Robin Beath to come forward. They're going to make a presentation of flowers to Tracy and Jan. thank Robin V for all the hard work he's put in today to organise in today's events. Tell me that John spoke at your 25th anniversary dinner. What do you recall from that evening? Well, that, that evening, um, he brought Christmas to my household in September because if, if John remembers, John had honoured us by doing his first public speaking event at our 25th anniversary dinner. And John phoned me up on the Tuesday night and said, could I come down to the house and perhaps speak to you about who the, the sort of worthies are in your club? And John, I says, yeah, no other. He says, so I went away and sat down and, and the doorbell rang. And my young son, who is, he's a Hearts fanatic, the door, I says, you better answer the door. He says, okay. He come back, and I've never seen a face like this except for Christmas morning. He come back and he says, Dad, John Robertson's at the door. I says, what's he wanting? <laughs> I said, don't know, but you may ask him in. 
So he, he come in and John and I sat and blethered and everything else and I had two or three books and my son had two or three books and John says, can I borrow the books? I says, certainly. So John went away them in 1994, so I've got a message from my son. He said, can I get my books back? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you, Robin. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to invite the former chairman and the man responsible for signing Robo, Robo Archie Martin. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd just like to tell you how John was signed. A legend was born when John was signed. John was training at Easter Road and he then came to Tyne Castle to train as an S form boy. And he wasn't due to come in until the summer recess and the start of the next year. But John in his wisdom came to us at Christmas time to Bobby Monker and the then scout David Johnson and said, I want to come in in January. Well, that really did put the cat amongst the pigeons because we had a financial director at that time who wanted us to, to reduce the players to something like 14 and a fifth player or something. So Bobby Monker said to me, what do we do? And I said, well, I'll tell you what we do. He says, you bring John Robertson in and I'll take the blame. And that, in fact, is how John Robertson came to become a Hearts player. And that, that day, a legend was born. And it's been a great pleasure to watch you, John. Thank you. Thank you very much, Archie Martin. <laughs> Finally, John, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to recall Brother George, who I believe has penned a poem in John's honour. Well, hello ladies and gentlemen again. Uh, you'll, like, you'll need to excuse me if I'm a bit nervous tonight, but uh, generally when I'm faced with this amount of heart supporters, there's usually a pitch and a fence, uh, John Hughes and that in between us. So, so I'm a wee bit nervous. Um, uh, we know Mr. Mercer's in what table is it? Oh, Mr. Mercer, there. Uh, I was doing a leaf the other day and I come against this, I found this old decrepit club. I was just wondering if you would like to buy it. <laughs> and, and anything you pay, I'll go to class. OK. Um, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you'll probably know this. Well, he's considered this one a legend. It's my brother, my little bits. Now, Pat Stack is in here today, no, so it's not in your room with two legends in it. OK? Yeah, that's the for Pat Stack. I've just got to read these things, I say, bear with me, I'm very, very nervous, so if, if I'm shaking, it's not a drink, I can assure you. I've not had that much yet. It's simply called This Man, and it goes, Who is this man we honour here? Loved by his family, held so dear, by friends and fans, adored, revered, we can but wonder. With heart and soul, you sang his name, he raised such hope sparked a flame, his passion burned in every game, a raging thunder. Yet there within compassion lies, a tenderness behind his eyes. For those less fortunate he tries to ease their plight. He's a husband, father, brother, son, an uncle, cousin, wrapped in one. He's temperamental, yet he's fun, you'll know I'm right. From Celtic Park to Cowdenbeath, and too many times in sunny Leith. <laughs> He's given pleasure, brought on grief with a job well done. This is the man we honour here, a man well loved, well revered, legend to most, to others mere, John Robertson. Thank you very much, John. Fantastic.
In closing, ladies and gentlemen, I have read recently, John, that you failed to show the proper attitude and training. <laughs> Obviously, I have no knowledge of what happens at Livingston, but I do know that anyone who gave up his summer holidays year in, year out, to come down to Medibank Stadium with a view to improving his fitness is not someone who has a problem with his attitude and training. John, it has been a privilege for me to have played a minor part in a wonderful career. So John Robertson, this is your life. It was a right gotcha. I didn't have a scooby what was going on today. Um, I'd like to thank everybody that's put together. It's, it's marvellous. Uh, um, I remember it happened to Gary Mackay. It was a great occasion. Tonight it's been fantastic for me to be surrounded by so many friends, teammates. They're not just teammates, they are friends. I'm proud to call them that as well. Um, they've made marvellous contributions to this club, each and every one of them. I'm delighted to have done it. And to me, I would like to thank Hartwell Lothian Football Club because they gave me a platform for 17 years to play here, to entertain you, to score goals. And I've enjoyed my time doing it, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you, John Robertson. Special celebrations were over, John invited a selected few across to his bar to let their hair down. <laughs> <laughs>